Welcome to The Only Thing That Matters, getting your startup to product market fit here on Chicago Founders TV. We bring you interviews with Hall of Fame level founders on the secrets to their success, how they achieve product market fit so you can nail it in your own startup. Today's episode features my friend Jay Shikawit, founder of Fieldglass, an enterprise SaaS company that Jay built and sold SAP for a billion dollars. Jay has an unusual approach to finding product market fit. It's very effective, and it's very good at predicting upfront where you should look for it and where you'll find it. Jay starts his founder story interview by telling that story of how he uses that and how it played out with his early customers at Fieldglass. So I'll tell you, one of the hardest things to do in the B2B space, and maybe even the B2C space, the B2C space is in some ways even more difficult because you, you don't get to see the customers that much. Mm -hmm. But in the P2B space, once you've written up your business plan and created a sketch of a product, it becomes incredibly difficult to, to actually create the right product. I mean, you can write code and you know, you'll have something that works, but do you, of your laundry list of features and capabilities, what do you pick? Mm -hmm. You pick slightly wrong and you're off course. And that happened in our space and we saw people do the wrong things. Uh, the other thing you realize is that your product is actually forcing its way into a, into a rather crowded landscape of other products. So for instance, your product, our product in this case, might have a timesheet capability built in or an expense management capability built in. But when you look at the marketplace, there are standalone companies doing that, quite big and quite successful. So you have to ask yourself, should I build it or should I leverage one of those? Mm -hmm. It's a big decision and there's no obvious answer, but you have to stare at the, you have to stare at the underlying you know, factors and make some decision. The thing that we did in order to do this is, uh, I meant to mention this earlier, but I decided to do informational interviews before mm -hmm. we wrote a single line of code. Great idea. With uh, potential customers or even you know, people who knew the space. And I would call them through you know, the Kellogg you know, connections or the McKinsey connections. And it was quite easy to get 15, 20 minutes of people's time if you're not selling them anything. And uh, you know, in fact, I found that people were quite generous with their time because they were flattered that you were asking for their views as opposed to for their money. Right. Usually it's the latter, never the former. And some of these conversations became, you know, and I would, I would take them through a guided you know, set of questions. And the idea was to shed light on our own blind spots. Mm -hmm. And from those discussions, I did, I think, 50 of those, almost 50 of those, maybe more. And there was a body of notes that ended up forming the basis of our strategy, our pricing models. Uh, there were little insights into functionality, you know, et cetera. So you, you and I talked about this the other day and, you know, the blueprint of how you did that. Because lots of people, a lot of people talk to others and say, well, what do you think? What, you know? But I think the process you use is really interesting, and it's quite a blueprint. So It was a structured to, process, yeah. yes. So, exactly. So the mistake would be to just go in and say, I want to talk to you about this, and it becomes this loose, unstructured discussion. Uh, nothing or you, or you just start with talking about your idea. About your idea, which is the worst thing you can do, because nobody is actually interested in your idea. They're interested in their problem. Well, this is the problem. You're talking about your product. You're obsessing the product instead of the problem. Instead of the problem. But if you've been at this point thinking about the problem, then you have an interested audience. And the approach we took is, uh, I wrote up a two-page document describing, it was a very sort of a, sort of a consulting type document, but it described the situation mm -hmm. as I saw it, their world, you know, you've got a messy contract labor workforce, uh, Mavericks, Ben, whatever the thing is. So like, you know, do it for just a second. So you walk in and you've got a way of describing their problem. Right. So like you, you, you come to me and you say, um, I've heard people have this problem, and we, we talk about this, think about this. Did you did let them just talk then, or how, how did it work? We would, I would actually put the document in front of them, okay. or send it to them ahead of time, and ask okay. them to go through it mm -hmm. and uh, react to it. And they would, they would react to it. They would say, yes, that's us, or that's not us, but a little bit of you know, this. And so when you're done with that discussion, your document has become tighter, and you've developed new insight and new notes. And you've actually made a friend and someone you can call Later, so, you know, a couple of those people became our customers years later. That's great. And so, did you iterate the way you described it over time? It started to iterate, and it became longer. So, the you keep your one or two pager, you know, constant, but there's a body of work that starts to develop, you know, okay. beyond it. So, first is the problem. You get them talking about the problem. How long could you get them talking about the problem? You 
you know, I would ask for 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Often went, often went longer. And then at what point did you, at some point along the way, did you sort of say, what if? It's implied, you know, it's implied. And uh, or did you offer a value proposition? What if someone had this? Would you, would you be interested in that? Would that help solve your problem? Or did you leave that to later? We left that. You know, we left that to later. Sometimes it just comes naturally as a, as a result of it. But uh, I mean, the key here is you are selling before you have product. You're selling something. You're mm -hmm. selling your own credibility. You're selling the vision. You're putting, you're, you're, it's a fight for mind space, mm -hmm. for mind share. So that person is thinking about this problem. And he knows that you have something coming down the pike, maybe six or 12 months, and you, you're putting a marker so that you can return to him, mm -hmm. you know, six months from now. No, it makes a lot of sense. It's so let's let's talk for a minute. So you, you finally uh, you get your first sale. Talk about your first sale. Who was your first customer and how did you get your first customer? Our first customer was uh, Verizon, Verizon Wireless. Our second customer was AIG, and our third customer was GlaxoSmithKline. So we had three big ones right off the bat. And what was it that got you that first customer? Uh, it was Because nobody <laughs> wants, you know, only after you're successful they want to hear the first customer because... If you're in a big company in the middle management, you come back and say, how many customers do they have? And you say zero, right? right? It's a little risky to your career. Right. The, the first, you know, we got lucky, honestly, uh, with the first customer. There was a, there was a sales rep. Um, you know, he wasn't employed by us, but he happened to make a phone call and he you know, got somebody senior and he managed to get a meeting for some reason. I think there was a, some college connection or something like that. It was completely by luck. But when we got there, we saw what their problem was. It was a real problem. And then we swung in into high gear. And, uh, you know, there was, a, there was an individual there who had a very specific accrual problem. It was an accrual reporting problem. We didn't even understand it fully, but we committed to doing it. Hmm. And uh, her contention was, if you can solve this particular problem for me, I'll give you guys a shot. And you, you've got to find your way to the person who actually has a problem, who's who's feeling the burr in their saddle, you know, every night. Not the person who has a theoretical problem, it's the person who has an actual problem. Right. Top lessons learned, like if you were to say, if I had to do this all over again, if you turned around and founded a company tomorrow, what would be the top one, two, three things that you'd say, boy, I'd really do this? Whether you did it right the first time or got it wrong the first time, like what are they? If you were them, we're gonna do this, what would it be? All right, that's that's good. So in, in no particular order, I'll, I'll think of a few. So, one of the ways I think about a company now is I think of it as, a, as in three parts. So a company, when you're starting off, consists of uh, an idea. And by an idea, I mean the standards of the idea we talked about, which is it has to be sort of a commercially viable you know, idea, not just you know, something you thought of the other day. So a, a commercially viable idea that you're willing to get behind is one. The second is you need a team, so yourself and whoever else, and then you need capital. And my recommendation is that the entrepreneur should not try to bring all three to the table. They're, they're putting their life into it, right? They're putting their blood, sweat, and tears. You should be able to get investors interested in what you're doing. It's the first test of the entrepreneur. If you cannot raise money or even a little bit of money, and the, 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 the bar is so much lower these days than it used to be, you can start a company with very little, then it's telling you something, there's something wrong. So that's, that's my first takeaway. Even having capital, I would actually still go out and test the market for someone's willingness to back you. So that's one. I'd say the, 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 the second is I would, not, I would not get into a space that I hadn't soaked in for, for a while. And soaking, marinating is a big theme for you, right? I totally agree. It's yes. a great point. It's a, it's a big theme. Now, we all know one of your spaces. What happens if you don't know a space? So there's ways to do it. You know, I'd, describe one technique we did, which is just deeply immersing yourself in. This is a great consultant skill. So you know, having spent some time at, at McKinsey, I was there for about three years, uh, you know, just long enough to know the essential skills of an mm -hmm. of a entry level consultant. But asking questions and being inquisitive, you can make up a lot of time by doing that. 